Alright, let's start with the volley. Right, do the old guys really know something that we don't, that we missed, or was some of the magic really lost? The rackets got better, the ground strokes got better, but why hasn't the volley got better? Are people just too fast nowadays to put a volley away? They made it look so easy back then, and on top of that, wooden rackets? Are you kidding me? See, the funny thing today is the athletes are better, the training is better. I'm going to argue it's not just a lack of practice either. Alright, so here we go. What's going on guys? Coach Steven with 15 points of tennis. And today we're going to be talking about power. How to use power, all right, and how to diffuse power. First of all, diffusing power when someone's ripping the ball hard at you, okay, what to do. Second of all, okay, how to create more pace if you're trying to finish points and put the ball away. Now, I don't know if you fell into this category. I just see this all the time. And take the backhand, for example. All right, let's say someone's ripping the ball hard and flat into your strike zone on the backhand. And your backhand might feel good. You might be able to hit the ball hard back and it feels strong and stable. You might look like a pro. But once your opponent starts to hit that ball higher and softer, okay, with less pace, even if the ball's in your strike zone and you're swinging as hard as you can, I know for a lot of backhands, or just a lot of people out there, you know, they feel helpless. They're un no matter how hard they swing, nothing is coming off. They're hitting the ball like two miles an hour. All right, same thing with the volley. Your volleys might look feel good when someone's ripping the ball at you, you can reflex it back and hit it hard. But once someone hits the ball soft, once the ball floats and lofts a little bit more, you lose confidence in putting the ball through the court and you have to resort to just angles and drop shots, which isn't bad, but there's a better way. And this reminds me of, if you remember Andy Roddick, okay? And for, before I criticize Andy, he's actually one of my favorite players to watch. He had a world-class serve, world-class overheads, he wasn't technically perfect like Roger, but I mean, Andy was super mentally tough. But one of the reasons why he had to be so mentally tough is he kind of struggled to finish points inside the court and around the net, especially. And if you remember the three Wimbledon finals, he lost to Federer. The one U.S. Open final, he lost to Federer. Again, the coaches told him, you know, Andy, you got to rush the net, charge the net, you know, move forward, put balls away. But there was, and even if that was the right strategy, which, you know, is debatable. But even if coming to net and moving forward was the right strategy, they were sending Andy Roddick to the slaughterhouse because his volleys weren't good enough, weren't penetrating enough to even tickle Roger. Roger's having a field day, and he was passing shot, passing shot, passing shot, passing shot, passing shot. Two. Not good enough. He jumps out to a commanding lead early. He just didn't get his racket in the ready position, and Federer put up. All right, and that's what we're going to explore a little bit more today. So, without further ado, before we roll into the video, there's a subscribe button on the lower right hand corner. And after you hit that button, there's this little bell. If you hit the bell, it makes sure you get notifications when I upload new videos. And again, you know, everything I upload, I try my best to make sure it's the best quality I can put out. And it's truly, truly valuable to your guys' tennis game, all right? So, we're taking a little bit of a journey here, all right? So sit back, relax, let's get started. All right, now it's demo time. And this is going to be a very simple demo, but very instructive and very crucial to your understanding, okay, how this works. This is deflecting versus creating pace. Now, we're going to do deflecting first. If I'm going to brace for a lot of impact, okay, now, I'm going to have the student here try to push me over as hard as he can, or not as hard as he can, but try to push me over with some force. Now, if he's going to push me over, what position should I get my body in? All right now, he's going to push me. Now, if I'm, if I'm standing up straight like this, like a bowling pin, and he pushes me, ugh, I have no base. I fall over. So, how am I going to brace for impact and stabilize myself? Well, first thing I'm going to do, look, watch my feet, right? I'm going to have, take a wider stance. 
and this wider stance, I can bend my knees and lower my center of gravity. So now when he pushes on my shoulder here, I'm much more stable. See how I can resist and push back? All right, that's deflecting. Now, if I'm going to create force, but in the next demo, I'm going to see if I, how far and hard I can push him. If I'm trying to knock him over, what do I do? All right, let's say I'm trying to push him over. All right, and you think, okay, look, let me get low. Let me assume the stance I did in the, in the last demo. Okay, let me try that, right? If my, I'm going to get low like this to try to push him. Now look, if my feet are too wide like this, and I'm trying to push, uh, 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 I can't really push him very hard. And why? Because my, my base is too wide. I can't use my legs. Actually, my, my legs are stuck. My legs are immobilized. If I want to apply serious force to him and, and push him far, I'm not going to have a wide base. I'm actually going to get really close to him like this and have a more narrow base. With a more narrow base, I can bend my knees. I have more vertical movement now. And if I'm going to push him, I'm going to rise up and push. You see that? So that's creating force to push him versus this is diffusing and deflecting pace. Okay, can I get the racket? Now that's, again, this concept works on all the ground strokes. And that's what we're going to talk about, all right? So when we hit ground strokes, if I'm deflecting pace, if a ball's coming hard at me, a lot of coaches say to sit on the ball, stay low. And that's exactly right. If the ball's coming hard, again, I'm going to lower my center. Of, I'm going to be like a rock, right? Immovable, boom, right? And you see Djokovic, when he's hitting that low, those low balls, ah, he stays low through the entire shot. Again, if I were to come up like this on a ball that, that's coming hard on, and fast at me, if I were to rise and I make contact when I'm up straight, bang, the force of the ball is going to knock me over like a bowling pin. All right? So it's very important to stay low on your ground strokes when you're deflecting. So I want you to notice how level my head stays. The level of my head this stays down all the way until I finish a shot. Again, do not come up for air until you finish a shot. So stay low when the ball comes hard and or deep. And same thing with this point. Right? I know the court was wet in the back, so I'm trying to hug that baseline and deflect. Now I do a pretty good job deflecting and I miss the volley, unfortunately, but oh well. But, like we just showed you on the demo, it's not always good to stay low. Because, see, a lot of people who are used to deflecting a lot of pace on their strokes with a wide stance, and I see this all the time, when people try to create pace, again, the people who are used to deflecting take such a big step like this, they can't create pace, and because my legs, although they're strong and stable, they can't rise up into the ball, they can't push because they're stuck, they're, then you have to resort to using your arms to hit the ball like that. And that's why... Backhands that are good at deflecting pace, or any stroke for that matter, is not fundamentally good to create pace. And that's why some people have problems putting the ball away. Now, if I'm going to create pace, what do I need to do? What does my backhand look like? My backhand looks like, I mean, I'm, I still get low, like I showed you in the demo, but my feet are closer together. And what that allows me to do is watch the level of my head as I hit, I'm rising up and I'm pushing up. Right, because coaches say to stay low, stay low, but like you don't always want to stay low. Sometimes you want to stay low. You want to start low when you're creating power and hitting the, and, and generating pace. You want to start low, but you want to rise up. Because when I see the pros hit, they're not staying low when they're creating pace. You see some of the biggest forehands hit on tour. When they make contact with the ball, they're jumping. They're rising. They're in the air at contact, right? They're in the air. So clearly they're not staying low. And that's the big difference here. So a practical example I like to use, obviously the ball's coming hard and fast versus soft. That's going to change the stance you take. But even a good example is like first serve, second serve. Assuming someone has like a traditionally hard first serve and, a, and more of a spin second serve. A first serve, I'm going to hit my low split uh, and stay low through the ball there. Second serve, I'm going to hit, a, again, a low split, but I'm looking to rise up and punish the ball like that. So I've literally seen coaches tell students to stay low when they're hitting balls like this with no pace, and obviously a hand beat has no pace on it, but look at how much energy I'm expending and very little power. 
on the flip side, if you rise up into the ball, and look, a lot of these balls are pretty flat, no lie, I can get a decent amount of power. Okay, at least I can do some damage rising up, and look at the knees go from being bent to straightening out. And as the knees straighten out, as the legs straighten out, my head rises. Okay, very important to watch the top of my head. So when you see a float slice, for example, all right, getting low and rising up, straightening the legs. And the other example we talked about, deflecting hard first serves. Notice, again, the level of the head and the strong wide base. Now, a little different on a second serve, you see, again, a low split step, but a little rise up with the legs right there. And in slow motion, again, the straightening out slightly. And again, because the serve slow, I'm going to take a little hop, which allows me to rise into the return. Now this next shot, when we talk about rising into the ball, he's going to be falling backwards, moving backwards, right there. And he can still get a lot of power, again, because he's rising up into the ball, okay? And that's the power, again, of pushing up, even though he doesn't even have any form of momentum. And again, I know that was a little hard to see, but you get the point. You can be moving backwards, but pushing up into the ball, still get a ton of power. I do want to end these series of examples by saying that there's no absolutes in tennis. So after the return, you still see me rise up into that ball, even though it has some decent pace on it. Again, my feet close together, and I move, my head goes up just a little bit. Same thing, even a deep ball that's coming pretty hard, I still rose up. So you can still rise up, you just gotta time the ball well. Now on the flip side, look, deflecting pace doesn't mean hitting soft. You can still take a big cut at it, just stay down and keep your center of gravity low. Blake holding steady here. Oh, and he's oh, got it. <laughs> All right, now guys, here's where we take this concept to the next level on the volley. Now, just know that every principle, right, that we use to generate power in terms of kinetics that works on the ground stroke applies to the volley. It's going to change your, the way you think about the volley, all right? Now, most of us were taught to this is how I was taught to volley, to hit a split step, crossover step, volley. Split step, crossover step, volley. And I still teach this, again, but I try to put it into context so, you, you can, so my students can understand when it's right and when it's wrong. Now, when you do this crossover step, like I just showed you, what just happened to my front foot? The step, where did my energy just go? My energy just got diffused into the ground. Now you wouldn't hit ground strokes like that, would you? You wouldn't hit ground strokes like this. Again, unless you're diffusing a ton of pace, you would step and lean on the ball like that. Unless you're diffusing pace, you're losing a ton of power every time by stepping and volleying. Like try, try put volleys away, stepping and volleying, and hitting it really hard. Exactly like we showed you on the ground stroke. When you want to create pace on your volley, instead of stepping and hitting, you should actually be rising as you hit. So when I hit a volley, I'm trying to punish the volley. I'm in the air and rising. Ah, ah, I'm going up on my volley. So instead of thinking going down like this, you're actually thinking volley low to high. Crazy, right? Now, it's not that crazy. When you think about the old school players, just think John Macro. Just think the days of the wooden racket. You see all the players, like you do the Macro. I kind of laughed at this when I first learned about this. When McEnroe's volleying, uh, 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 he's going up and volleying every time. And one thing about those older players, they figured something out. They really figured it out because they had to make, again, they made a living off the volley. Right? So just think about that for a moment. What a great second serve. Now you might be wondering, Coach Steven, look, if I'm rising on my volley, like going up when I volley, and that might look a little funny to you, look, I want to put the ball down into the court. I'm trying to hit the ball down. If I'm rising, won't I hit the, hit the back fence? Isn't that a little strange? Well, let me ask you this. All right, when you hit a serve and you're jumping into your serve, you're actually rising as you hit. You're not hitting the, 
a servant to the back fence, are you? Same thing with the overhead. You're rising as you hit overhead, but the ball is going down. How about a hammer forehand where you're jumping up and rising, but again, the ball is going down. See, the thing is, my body can be rising here, but my hand is going down. All right? And I want you to understand the, just the basic kinetics of it. And if you haven't watched a video on the kinetic chain, again, that's so crucial and essential that you get that video too. Um, understand this. For this one, it really makes sense. But when I, again, after I push with, with my legs here, the energy has already transferred from my leg through my body to the arm to the hand. The power trans because I'm not hitting the ball with my with my legs. I'm not making contact with the ball with my with my torso. What makes contact with the ball is my hand. And so, again, if I'm falling in the air and I'm rising, the power transfer is is already in the hand. Okay, and then you like you see when pros punish the ball and they're jumping, again, the energy has already left their feet. It's already into the hand, right? Because the, the power needs to culminate at that single point. Now, when you guys practice the rising volley, okay, and we're gonna show you in the demo, but when you guys practice this, what the most likely thing is gonna happen is you guys are gonna be jumping too early, okay? So I just want you to think about, like when you hit a volley, the kinetic chain is much shorter when you hit a volley then when you hit a ground stroke, it's, it's much longer. So when you, as you push up and rise up with your legs, a lot of you guys are gonna jump, pause, and then volley. And there's gonna be a break in your kinetic chain, which is wrong. So it's gonna be like jump and then volley, which is wrong. As soon as, because the kinetic chain on the volley happens so fast when I hit the rising volley, if you can see my ankle, as soon as I just barely, leave, as soon as I push with the ankle and leave the ground slightly, I'm already making contact here because this, this chain is so short. It's a much shorter stroke. So I'm volleying here, here. I'm not volleying here. You see that, the difference there? Once you pause in the air after you have jumped, you've already lost your chain and then you're just using your, your arm again. All right, so that's one of the biggest things when you start to go out and work on it. Again, it takes a little bit of time to get used to volleying low to high instead of high to low and putting your volley back into the ground, your energy back into the ground. So before I go any further, again, volleys that are hard and or fast, I'm staying down on the ball and just using the pace, deflecting the ball back. And here I gotta aim lower, obviously, so making slight adjustments always, getting my timing and strike zone down. All right, that's better. Okay, that's better. Now, when the ball is floating and slow, I, there's no way for me to stay down. I'm rising up into the ball. And you can see there's no way I can hit a volley nearly that hard if I were to stay down. This is a volley that I'm going to punish or really put through a guy in doubles or even in singles. Now you could say that I probably just got a lot of forward momentum on the last few volleys and you're partially right but watch these two next volleys. I don't get a whole ton of forward momentum. But I'm, again, I'm jumping up and I still get a pretty good power. Okay. Now, practical scenarios of this. Look, again, this step volley, it has its place. Staying low on the volley, we showed you in the demo, has its place. When you're deflecting, when someone rips the ball hard at you, you're not rising, you're gonna get knocked over. You've got to stay low. And so a lot of times in the modern pro tour, again, the ground strokes are coming much harder. You don't see the pros rise up as much, right? But if you watch Federer, and Federer in singles compared to doubles, in singles, they, a lot of times they hit a transition volley and take two steps after, so they're not rising as much or moving to net. But when you watch Fed, there's still a big difference between staying neutral here, watch my head, between staying neutral versus going down. Okay, you can get a lot more power being neutral than you can, again, putting your energy into the ground. And rarely do you see Federer blow it like this, okay, because he, he would lose a lot of power stepping down. I'd say a, a more practical example of using this volley, and I don't know if I can demo it, but is in doubles. 
okay? When you have to volley, like singles, you can a lot, a lot of times angle, you don't have to hit the volley as hard. But in doubles, let's say someone rips the ball at you, you, you reflex the ball at the doubles partner, and they pop it up, and then you punish in the air like that, all right? And because obviously in doubles, you have to hit, be able to put, hit the ball hard enough to put the ball through a player, because sometimes you don't have the angles, obviously two people covering the court, okay? At least on a doubles tour, okay, if you can't rise on your volleys and put volleys away, you probably won't survive. Now, doubles, there's so much going on. There's four players moving. Okay, I didn't notice the rising volley for the longest time there. He's rising to put the ball away, especially if he plays back in slow-mo. Rising, 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 especially to get the pace that you see. Now, in singles, these transition volleys where you have space and forward momentum, you don't see, you see my head stay more level, right? You don't see as much rise. And there, but there's a big difference, again, to repeat, between staying at a more of a neutral level versus going down. And obviously, if I'm playing a point in singles, I use a lot of angle, but if I'm going to punish like there, my head is going to be rising a little bit. And this really does make a difference, and I hope now you can see the difference between Raddick's volleys versus Fed's volleys, how much Nike gets. Although he's not going up a ton, he's staying pretty neutral. Feels like I've been a little harsh on the tr on the volley that a lot of us have learned the step and hit step and hit but i want to end this video and again i for you guys i always want to put what i teach into context because there's always, always a right and wrong if you want to be great at tennis you have to know everything situationally and when it's right and wrong you have to know all the scenarios because there's never a one size fits all in tennis all right so when you actually step into the ground again and take a bigger step like we talked about in, in that first demo it diffuses pace. And there are a lot of times when you're hitting your angles and drop volleys, you want to diffuse the pace. Okay, on a drop volley or an angle when the ball's coming hard. Okay, so again, angles and, and drop volleys are very, very good. You might actually want to take, take that step. Okay, versus rising up into the ball. And you, can't, you won't be able to rise up into every ball. Again, there's a spectrum and there's all in between. Yes, the full spectrum, okay, when you're hitting angles and drop shots, I'm taking pace off the ball. And that step actually allows me to diffuse pace, right? Because I'm floating the ball, I'm doing this little mini lob over the net and dropping it softly over the net. Perfect, all right? And you're gonna watch this point, and at some point I'm gonna get into the net. And again, getting low, sitting back in your stance, being very stable and solid. I could have even gotten lower there perhaps. That's what you want to do when you're going for drop shots and angles. And that's why, well, if you can't rise on your volley, at least you know now drop shots and angles are my thing. Now once you start really practicing this and getting it down, I think one of the harder parts is when to rise. See, so I rose on a few, now that one I'm sitting. I'm rising to that one, I'm rising to that one. All right, and you're gonna see a mix of these, even just sitting again, and now I'm gonna rise up a little bit, I'm going to sit there because the ball is low, so a lot of it depends on the ball. See, that last one was low, but I rose up. So when should you rise up? Look, if you see it early, see how I saw that ball early? Or what I mean by seeing early means you can almost, if you can predict where the ball is going, obviously that one's obvious to put away and rise up into. But if you see it early, you can put it away pretty easily. Like this next one here, did I stay low on that volley? But I see it early, put it away. And it's just like any other shot. If you see it early, you can hit it hard. You can do more with it because you're in rhythm. And now that was a beautiful angle from the Brian Bros right here. I think these are great, great volleyers, more modern day volleyers, but again, you know, a lot to learn from watching doubles and carrying the singles. The reason why I bring this topic up is if you look at the old players, more often than not, you see the best players, even like you know the Bryan brothers, when they're punishing balls, they're rising. You see the old players, when they hit the ball, you see the legs going up in, into most of the, sh of the shots. Whereas you see, you go to a lot of the college campuses these days and you see the players play, you see, see most of the, all the kids going down nowadays, which is a stark comparison to the old ways of volleying. And look, there's, there's gems everywhere. Everywhere you look, each generation has figured these things out. And again, we want to bring it all to you guys just to show you the full spectrum of body mechanics, how to apply it to your game, how to, again, be the best possible ten tennis player. At least for me, you know, I'm always adding different pieces. 
and there's always ways to improve. All right? So thanks so much for watching. That wraps up this video. Again, if you hit that subscribe button in the lower right-hand corner, we'll see you on the next one.